And we've talked about Jesus all morning. And uh, the last three or four months for me have been different with preaching. I've just been preaching about Jesus. I feel like every message I've preached has just been about Jesus. About the cross, about salvation, about what he can do for us and how he can still change a life. And I know those things are simple and we've heard them over and over and over again. But sometimes I think we got too, somewhere along the line, got too educated for our own good. And we've made salvation too difficult when it's not difficult. It's pretty simple today. It's a pretty simple thing to do to ask Jesus into your heart. And this morning, that's, that's just who I'm going to preach on, if that's okay. I'm just going to preach on Jesus. And uh, if you think it's too elementary, you're the ones that asked me. So here I am. Isaiah 45, and I'm just going to scatter through Isaiah 45. Here's what it says. Isaiah 45, verse 45, or verse, chapter 45, verse 5 says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 6, in the last part, says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 14, last part. Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Isaiah wasn't saying there, there is no God, period. He's saying there is no God like that God. That's what Isaiah is saying in, in, in verse uh, 14. Verse 18, last part. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 21. There is none beside me. Verse 22. For I am God... And there is none else. Several times in one chapter, Isaiah is trying to tell us that you ain't going to find no God like that God up there. I had someone uh, uh, about a year or so go come up to me and ask me, said, said, Kev, why does the Bible sometimes repeat itself? And he took me to the book of Psalms. And, and there was a verse in the book of Psalms in one chapter that was there four times. And, and he showed me this. And he said, Why? Why waste, the, why waste the, the page? Why waste the verse? Why not just say it once? And I said, buddy, don't you know that we're hard-headed people? Right. Yeah. We're hard-headed people. I, I, don't, I don't know why, but we are. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a lot of pounding and driving right. to get something through our thick skulls to understand right. it. And in one chapter, it said over and over again, the same exact verse, it was the same word for word, the same thing. And here's five or six times in Isaiah 45 where he's trying to show us this morning that you can search all you want to search and you can look all you want to look. You can try to find as much as you want to find, but you can travel this country and this world far and wide, but you ain't going to find no God like that God up there. And this morning, there's all kinds of gods. There, there's gods. I mean, it seems like there's a new God just pops up every month somewhere. And there's gods all over the place. But I can promise you this morning, there ain't no God like that one. There's a lot that God up there has done that separates himself from the other gods. And can I say this morning, I'm thankful that God that's living up there this morning is also living on the inside of my heart. I can feel him. I know that he's there. When I wake up in the morning, when I bow my head in the afternoon, and when I go to sleep at night, I can feel his presence. I can feel his touch. I can feel his spirit with me wherever I am. Listen, this morning, if I go to Walmart, guess where God's at? He's a Walmart. When I go into the woods and climb up a tree, guess where God is? He's in the woods up a tree. When I go to, to Rule King and buy a bag of corn for my deer, guess where God is? He's at Rule King with me. When I get up in the morning and I drive to my job, guess where God is? He's living on the inside of us today. He is. And when we're talking about God, when we're talking about Jesus, I find myself having trouble finding the words to say when I talk about him. Right. And this morning, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. You can laugh, you can cry, you can whatever you want to do, but this is the God's honest truth today. Right now, you're looking at a redneck hillbilly. That's who you're looking at. Right. I mean, you want to know how redneck I am? I got a coon dog at my house. Right. That's how redneck I am. Make matters worse, I got, worse, I got two of them there. Right. Uh, I love to hunt. I love to, uh, Bethany's uncle can drive by my house on a golf cart and say, hey, Caleb, you busy? No, let's go shoot something. Yeah. I don't guess a rock. 
a groundhog, coyote, something. Let's go find something to shoot at. That's just who I am. I can help. I'm just a, I, I just who I am. I'm just a hillbilly. I, I don't know much about science, but I can tell you a little bit about a chainsaw. If you understand what I'm trying to say this morning. I ain't got no big degree. I never went to Bible college. I never went to college really a day in my life. Got a high school diploma, and that's about as far as it goes. And when I go out into the world and I explain Jesus to somebody, and I tell them about God, I look at him and I say, don't listen to what I'm saying because I'm underestimating him. I'm trying to explain how good he is. I'm trying to explain how wonderful his grace is. I'm trying to explain how big and how wonderful his love can reach. But you're just looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about because I don't. It's just something you gotta experience for yourself. It's never made sense to me how God can take a dirty, nasty sinner and they can come to an altar, bow their unworthy head and say, God, I'm no good for nothing. I'm worthless, I'm empty, I'm miserable. But if you could, will you come into my life and save me and change me and make me brand new and I ain't ever found nobody yet that God cannot save this morning. Amen. Amen. I'll say it this way. I am a redneck hillbilly. I am. That's just who I am. You, you can love me. You can hate me for it. That's just who I am. But this morning, if you went and you found the most five educated men in the world, and you said, I want you to do nothing but study the life of Jesus and study God and study all this, uh, the, 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 the word of God and everything that's involved with it. And I want you to go to, to Life Change Church and explain to them how wonderful he is. Their words would be too small. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm saying I'm a redneck hillbilly and I am. But if you went and found the most educated man, the biggest Bible scholars that the, the world's ever seen and said, explain Jesus. It would still fail. Amen. Their words would be too small. Amen. Their words would be too weak. And when I go to talking about him, when I go preaching about him, I almost feel like I'm shameful because I'm not doing a good enough job trying to explain just who he is Amen. and what he can do. Amen. You know, there's not a whole lot that heaven and hell have in common today. There's not a whole lot they have in common, but there is a few things they do have in common. For example, one thing they have in common is they're both highly underestimated. Right. Heaven is so much more glorious right. than what Hollywood could ever put together. Right. Heaven is so much glorious than what I could preach or Mick could preach or Nick right. could preach or we could talk about for hours. We could be here this time tomorrow trying to preach how glorious it is, but we wouldn't I mean, have a drop in the bucket right. to how glorious it really is. Hell is so wicked and so evil and so nasty once again, Hollywood couldn't put a movie good enough together to explain how awful that place is. Right. I couldn't preach how awful it is. Once again, we couldn't talk and preach this morning how awful it really is. And I find myself trying to preach about Jesus and feel like I'm coming up short because I can't find the words to say. Amen. Can't find the words to say. But for a few moments, Isaiah is trying to show us there ain't no God like that one. That's what he's saying to us. There ain't no God like that one. Over and over again, he's trying to get through our thick skulls. Why has everything gone crazy? Because everybody's out there trying to find a little bit of satisfaction. They're trying to find just a little bit of joy, just trying to find something to live for. Can I tell you this morning, when you try Jesus and you ask him into your heart, that search party becomes over in your life and you no longer chase the alcohol or the men or the women or the drugs or whatever it is you're chasing. When you ask Jesus into your heart, somehow he covers it all. He covers it all. For a few moments, I want to preach on this. There ain't nobody like him. That's simple. I know it's simple, but you asked me to come and that's just who I am, simple, sons. But this morning, there ain't nobody like him. I want to preach on that thought just for a few moments. There ain't nobody like him. You know, I, I thought about this and uh, many of you probably know her, many of you don't, but she is a woman in my life that I don't think there's anybody like her on earth. And that is Bethany's mamma, Lola. Man, I love that woman. I remember, I've been preaching now 13 years, and I remember one Sunday morning, years ago, I was preaching, and next thing I know, Lola May got up and beat the snot out of me. I mean, she got happy, and she began to slap my jaws, and, and it got to the point where when I got fired up and, and, and started preaching, and I seen her get up, I just went, I just, have at it, <laughs> have at it. But man, in my, in my opinion, 
Uh, what a woman. What a woman. She knows what it's like to bury a husband and bury kids. And knows what it's like to go through the turmoil of this world and, and to literally fight the devil. She knows what that's like. And if you went to her house this afternoon and knocked on the door and said, Lola May, in one sentence, what do you say about Jesus? She probably said, there ain't nobody like him. Right. Ain't nobody right. like him. Right. There ain't no God like that God. Right. Ain't no Savior like that Savior. Right. And this morning, I want to preach on that thought. There ain't nobody like him. First off, this morning, I want to look at this. There wasn't nobody born the way that he was born. I hope I'm in the right church this morning when I say this, but Jesus was born of a virgin. I believe that with my whole heart and I ain't got no trouble believing that. But when Jesus was born, there wasn't nobody born the way that he was born. His birth already as a baby separated him from every other God in the entire universe, him being born in that stinky old manger. I believe it just like the Bible says it. I believe an angel came down from heaven, told Virgin Mary that she was going to have a son. His name was going to be Jesus and he was going to be the savior of the entire universe. And Joseph ashamed of what he thought Mary had done, fell asleep and that very same angel came to Joseph in his sleep and told him don't be ashamed to take Mary as your wife for what's been done through her and in her has been done through the Holy Ghost of God and because Jesus Christ was born the way that he was born, hope shot across the entire world and across the entire universe all because of the way that he was born this morning. Listen to what Luke chapter 2 says, and I believe it. And so it was that while they were there and the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed around about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is this born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And, sh and he shall sign unto you that he shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, saying, Glory. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. What was they praising God for? Because they knew that Jesus Christ had left heaven and come to earth as a little baby for you and for me. And can I say this morning, you can look at all the other gods, but there wasn't none of them born the way that he was this morning. Amen. Wasn't nobody born the way that he was. But can I say, and I don't care if you're the type of person this morning that doesn't say amen, that's okay, all right? You can cough. I don't care what you do. You can grunt. You can moan. I don't care what you do. But when I say what I'm about to say, I need you to make a noise. I need you to do something. I need you not. This is the truth, what I'm about to say. For 33 and a half years, Jesus Christ walked this earth sinless, perfect, and spotless. Somebody do say something. Grunt, call, do something. He was perfect. For 33 years, Jesus Christ walked this earth and he didn't know sin. I know there's scholars, there's people with degrees that say it is absolutely impossible for Jesus to walk this earth and know sin. But listen to me, he was God wrapped up in flesh and he didn't know what sin was when he was on this earth. Didn't know what it was like to make a mistake. Even as a little boy in the temple, those people looked at him with great big eyes and said, who is this man? He was the son of God and he was perfect this morning. There wasn't nobody that lived life like Jesus Christ lived. He came to this earth and showed us how to live. He loved. He was there for people. He touched blinded eyes where they could see. He spoke Lazarus' name and he had no choice but to get up because of who he was. Amen. Well, nobody lived the way that Jesus lived on earth. Wasn't nobody born like him. There wasn't nobody that lived like him. I could preach for about two hours if you wanted me to this morning with this message. I won't do that to you. But there wasn't nobody that was born the way he was. There wasn't nobody that lived like he did. And my goodness sakes, there wasn't no other God out there that died the way that he died. Right. Amen. When Jesus hung on that cross, when he hung on that cross and cried out the words, it is finished, what was finished? The perfect spotless lamb of God died. And God turned his face on his own son just for, just for you and just for me this morning. So you and I could experience what salvation is all about. Right. Wasn't nobody that died the way that he did. And this morning, I look at what Jesus has done, 
And like I said, if you wanted me to this morning, I could preach for about two hours right. trying to talk about him. Just trying to talk about him. Just trying to tell you a little bit about Jesus today. Yeah. And I don't know why God wanted me to preach this this morning. I, boy, I would have loved to be Luke chapter 1, but I know this is what God wants today. I know. Yeah. I know. Not because Google told me, but because God told me. Right. God told me. Right. And there wasn't no God that was born the way he was. There wasn't no God that lived like he lived. There wasn't no God that died like he did. But listen to me this morning when I say this. There ain't no God that can save like he can save. Amen. Ain't no God that can save like him. When he saves us, he changes us. He changes us. Through and through. Through and through. And about six or seven years ago, six or seven years ago, I was, I was, uh, preaching at a church and I, I become friends with a, with a boy there. He was about four or five years older than me and we become good friends. We coon hunted together, spent a lot of time together and he would tell me and share a little bit about his life with me and took his wife and kids to church and everything and his uncle, his uncle got sick. His uncle got cancer and he said, Caleb, he said, my uncle's a terrible, terrible man. And he had told me this before he got cancer. I knew this. He said, there ain't nobody that liked my uncle. He said, he would cuss you out. He would talk nasty. He would talk dirty. He was just a mean, old, nasty man. Never went to church a day in his life. And there ain't nobody likes him. He called me and told me that cancer was through his body. And that he had just a few months to live. And he said, Caleb, I know you don't want to. He said, but would you please go and visit him and talk with him? And I know you, you, I know Mick and Bethany and a few others here know me, but a lot of you don't. I didn't want to go talk to that man. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I didn't want to go talk to that man. There wasn't one ounce of me that wanted to go talk to I would, I would have rather drove around and found a church had 5,000 people and preached to them than go talk to this man. And I told him, I said, I said, man, are you sure you want me to go talk to him? He said, yeah, I do. I want you to go talk to him. You can ask my wife. I come home from work that day. I didn't eat dinner. I didn't eat. I, didn't, I mean, I felt like I was going to go preach a revival to a great big church. I mean, I was sick about it. Sick about it. I was studying the Bible. God help me find the words to say. Fill my mouth. Give me, put scripture in me. Give me something. Give me something. And I went, and it was on a Tuesday evening. I went to his house. My friend was there waiting on me in the house. He lived in a little single wide trailer, and I knocked on the door. I heard the words come in. And as I opened up the door, I'm praying, God help me. God help me. I was nervous. I, mean, I didn't want, I wanted to find the words to say. And I walked in there and I introduced myself and he said to me, I know who you are. And I'll say this this morning. You know what I found out when I got there? I found out that God got there long before I got there. That's what I found out. And I explained who I was. He told me he knew who I was. And he said, young man, he said, you tell me why God would want to save somebody like me. I ain't ever served him a day in my life. He said, I've cursed him to his face. I ain't ever went to church. I, I don't know nothing about it. I ain't lived for him in a minute that I've been on this earth. Why would I call upon him now in the shape that I'm in? Who am I to call upon him now in the shape that I'm in? I said, buddy, you're telling me that you ain't ever been to church. You ain't ever served God. You've, you've cussed God to his face. I said, but I've, I've went to church all my life. I was raised in church. I've been preaching for a few years. I know a lot there is to know about it. But here's the amazing thing about God. And this is all I told him. I said, the amazing thing about God is that he loves you just as much as he loves me. And he said, preacher, I was a young man, then I was preacher. He said, preacher, he said, you think God would save somebody like me? I said, I know God would save somebody like you. He said, so if I call upon him right now and he would come into my life, I'd go to heaven? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. 
He said, let's do it. He said, let's pray. I want to ask him into my heart. I thought I would have to explain to him. I thought I'd have to tell him. I thought I'd have to show him. But buddy, he grabbed my hand and he grabbed his nephew's hand. He threw that head back in the air and said, oh God, I'm sorry for the way I've been living. I'm sorry for the way I've been acting. If you would, would you please come into my life and change me? I ain't gonna be here much longer, but the time I do have, I'll, <laughs> the time I do have, I'll spend it serving you. And buddy, I mean to tell you, the Holy Ghost of God came in that single wide trailer right where we was at. He said, Cave, he said, aren't you preaching revival tonight? I said, no, not tonight. Starting Thursday night, I am. He said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Nephew said, you ain't no shape to go. You ain't supposed to leave this bed. He said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. We go. My nephew walked in. They got there just a few minutes late. I was sitting up front with the pastor. They walked in. He was walking on a little walker. He walked in that church. He was going like this. Never been in church a day in his life. And I, I thought he was just admiring the church and looking at the church. And after church was over, we was talking. He said, you know, Caleb, he said, I always heard all my life if I ever walked into a church, the walls would fall in. <laughs> <laughs> he says, so I'll just make sure it was going to stand. So absolutely, it was going to stand. We started singing that, that. It was on a Thursday night. We started singing. We started singing congregational songs. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. And everybody was on their feet clapping. He was on his feet clapping. I mean, don't know a thing what's going on. And after everybody sat down, he stayed up. And I thought, uh-oh, he's going to say something. And he did. He, he said, yeah, I want that microphone. I want everybody to hear me. I'm thinking he could cuss. He could, <laughs> who knows what he's going to say. I was trying to think of something I could say to say, hey, you got to wait, wait 48 hours for you to say something in church. <laughs> Because you could say, I, I, I was nervous. What's this man going to say? And he got that microphone. Listen, what he said. I, I, I remember it just like it happened yesterday. He said, I just want to let everybody know that God came to my house Tuesday night. Right. Yeah. Thank God. God came to my house right. Tuesday night. And he said, I asked him into my heart. And he said, I know a lot of people here know how I am and know who I was. He said, but that man's not here no more. He said, I ain't got much time left. But the time I do have, I want to spend it serving the Lord. Amen. And we could say, we could say, well, of course he made things right. He got cancer, didn't have long to live. We could say that. But this morning, it don't matter. All that matters is I know that man this morning's up there. Didn't live just a few weeks for God. But this morning, he's up there. Caleb, why would you tell us that story today? Because there ain't nobody that can save like he can. Amen. We're without excuse today. We're without excuse. If you're sitting here this morning and say, boy, I'd love to be saved, but there is no but. If you would love to be saved, I'd run to the altar right now. I wouldn't wait till I'm done. Run to the altar right now because listen to me, nobody can save like he can. Nobody can save like he can. I could stand up here and tell you story after story after story on how God has saved people down through the years and changed them completely through and through. I know of a man that was an alcoholic. Was 20, I think 24 years his wife went to church by herself. He got saved in a revival, went home, took the alcohol out of his fridge and dumped him down the drain and ain't drunk it ever since. I mean, God, when he saves somebody, he just don't do it a quarter of the way or half the way, but God does it all the way this morning. And I'm here to tell you, nobody can save like he can. Nobody can save like he can. Nobody was born like him. Nobody lived like him. Nobody died like him. And thank God, nobody can save like he can. Amen. If you're waiting for a president to save you, you're going to be waiting for a long time. If you're waiting for your husband or wife to save you, you're going to be waiting for a long time. But can I tell you this morning that Jesus' power and saving hasn't, hasn't decreased, but it's increased today. It's increased. Nobody can save like he can. Nobody can. But can I tell you, and I don't even know how, but nobody can love like he can. Nobody can love like he can. When Jesus stretched those arms on that cross, all I see is love stretched out for the entire world, stretched out for the entire world. And to think about how much I love my kids, how much I love my wife, I love my family that God's gave me. And to think that God loves me more, it's hard for me to put in my mind. 
I'm telling you, talking about Jesus is hard to explain. Hard to explain. You know, I've, this morning, talking about his love, there's a story. I, I hate to say that I stole a story off my dad, but I have. It's a story he told when I was a kid. And it's a story that I've still remembered today, and I've told it all across the, all the places I think I've went. I've told this story because I feel like there ain't no other story that explains God's love any better than this one. It was a story told of a pastor, a wife, and a little girl. The pastor's wife got sick. She passed away just moments after she got diagnosed with cancer. She passed away, and here was a young father and a young pastor tried to pastor this church, had an eight-year-old girl. Not understanding why God would do this, church was devastated. The, the pastor, the girl, was obviously devastated at the news that they had received and at what happened. The church got together and decided that they wanted to get that pastor and little girl away for a while. And they sent them off on a boat, on a cruise. They go on this, this cruise, and when they walk on the ship, the captain had found out that there was a preacher on board. He goes and finds him. and He says, preacher, he said, would you be interested every Sunday morning we have a service on this boat would you be interested in delivering a sermon this Sunday morning he said sir you don't understand he said I'm here with my, wife, or with my little girl my wife had just passed away said my church sent me on this ship just to get away for a little while said but I, I, I just don't feel I'm in the place to, to deliver a message he said I understand completely he said I'm sorry I even asked I didn't know the situation and I'm sorry I even asked you a few days goes by and the Holy Ghost begins to, to speak to this preacher. And he said, even though you're devastated, you still got a job to do. And he felt led to go find that captain and tell him that he would preach Sunday. So he goes, he finds him, he says, he says, Captain, have you found anybody? Found anybody at all to preach Sunday? He said, no, I haven't. He said, well, he said, I'd be more than happy to do it. And he said, are you sure? He said, I don't want to put that on you. He said, with what you're going through, he said, I'll, I'll do it. He said, no problem, no problem. He goes that Sunday morning and he preaches on the love of God. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Preached on that and his little eight-year-old girl sat in the front row listening to everything her daddy preached that morning. He went out after the service on the edge of the boat and was looking out over the water and he felt a tug on his coat jacket. I know what them tugs are all about. Felt a tug on his coat jacket and he looked down at his little girl and she said, Daddy, that was a great message this morning. Great mess. You know what my little girl tells me? She says she don't like when I preach because it's too long. <laughs> this little girl sounds a whole lot sweeter than my little girl, I guess. <laughs> so that was a great message you preached this morning. She said, but you didn't make something clear. She said, just how big is God's love? Well, that's hard to explain. That's hard to explain to you this morning, let alone an eight-year-old little girl. But the best way he knew how, he said, honey, I want you to look out to the right as far as you can look until your eyes can't look no further. She looked as far as she could look. She said, okay, Daddy, I'm looking as far as I can look. So look out to the left as far as you can look until your eyes can't take you no further. She got down and she would look and she would look and she said, okay, Daddy, I'm looking as far as my eyes will take me. So I want you to look up. I want you to find the highest cloud that you can find. She looked up and for a moment. She, she said, all right, Daddy, I see the tallest cloud I can see. Can't see no further. So I want you to look down on the bottom of the ocean as far as your eyes will look till you can't see no further. She looked down and said, okay, daddy, I'm looking as far as I can look. I can't see no further. He said, honey, that's how much God loves you. And she stopped for a moment and she kind of smirked and she said, daddy, she said, you want to know what's funny about all this? He said, what's that, honey? He said, if God's love is as far as my right and as far as my left as I can see, and if it's as high up and as low down as I can see, here you and I stand right now in the middle of God's love. If you're lost this morning, listen to me loud and clear. Yeah. Right now where you're sitting, don't get up and move over there because you're just going to be in the middle of God's love too. <laughs> Wherever you are, you and I are always going to be standing right in the middle of God's love. Yeah. I'm saved this morning and I'm thankful for it. You know, it's easy for me to love people that love me back. Right. But it's, it's hard for me to love people that talk about me like a junkyard dog. Right. But you want to know what's so great about God? <laughs> is that we can serve him the best of our ability 
but the dirty, nasty sinner out there that's rubbing his name in the mud, dragging it through the mud and, and living like a junkyard dog. You know what God does this morning? He just loves them just as much as he loves us. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. But what love God has for us today, we're without excuse. I got one more for you and I'll be done, I promise. I don't want to be long-winded. I got one more. There ain't no God out there that can move the way our God can move. There ain't no God that can speak the way that our God can speak. You know what we need this morning so desperately? We need a move of God. That's what we need. That's what our community needs. That's what our country needs. That's what you need. And that's what I need is a move of God. That's what we need. Why? Because he's the only thing that can fix the mess we're in. We can't fix it on our own. We can't put the pieces back together again. And I'm thankful that God's moved in my world. But you might be sitting here this morning and saying, Cave, you're telling me there ain't no God like that one. Right? You don't know the places I've been. You don't know what I've done. And you say that God's moved in your world and God's moved in Mick's world and, I, and, I, and a couple of the other ones, but, but God can't move in my world. I've went too far. I've too, made too many mistakes. I've done too much wrong. I'm here to tell you this morning, God can move in your world. Yeah. I want to prove it to you just real quick and then we're going to be done. And we're going to have, I'm going to have the Joneses come if they would. I know she's holding that baby. I hate to take that baby away from you. But I'm going to have them sing here in just a minute. But before they come, I want to prove to you, if God can move in my world, and God can prove and, mix, and move in mixed world, mixed world and, and some of the ones here's world, I want to prove to you right now that God can move in your world. I was interested in looking and seeing the first time in our Bibles that we've seen God move. And I figured it would be in Genesis, Exodus, somewhere along in there. But to my surprise, we see God move in Genesis chapter number one, and verses number one and two. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Listen, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. It didn't take God very long to move, did it? It didn't take him very long to move. Listen to me now. If you've ignored me all this time, listen to what I'm about to say. I get sick of people. People have too many excuses. I can't serve God because of this, and I can't serve God. Listen, there's going to come a day where you wish you had served God. And say, oh, it won't be a lot sooner than what you think. So listen to what I'm about to say, because I'm sick of excuses. You ain't going to, you're going to be without excuses this morning to come and ask Jesus into your heart, all right? God can't move in my world, Caleb. Well, let's look at this. And the earth was without form. You know with something, when something's without form, you know what the definition of that is? Miserable. That means it was miserable. That means that there was a time this earth was miserable because it was without form. And then the Bible says that it was void. We all know what void means, empty. It was empty. And the Bible says that the darkness was up on the face of the deep. You know what a definition for darkness is? Miserable and worthless. Miserable and worthless. Why? I live up a holler, and when the electric goes out, I can see how it's miserable. It's pretty miserable. When you go coon hunting and the moon's nice and covered and you turn your light off, I have to turn my light back on because I'm a little bit of a chicken. I got to have a, I have to have some, I'll be able to see something. So if the world was without form, which was worthless, and it was void, which was empty, and it was miserable because it was dark, if God will move in a world like that, then why can't God move in your world? If God moved in a world that was miserable, worthless, and empty, can I tell you there's been times I've felt worthless, empty, and miserable? I have felt that before. And I'm sure there's been times you have felt that before. And if God will move in a world like this, then God will move in your world. He will move in your world. This morning, we are without excuse. We are without excuse to ask Jesus into our heart or to fix the mess that we're in right now. Because listen to me, there ain't no God like that one. I've tried with my feeble little mind to explain just a little bit about Jesus this morning. I've tried the best, best that I knew how. I know I ain't very good at it, but I tried the best I knew how. And if you're here this morning and you've got 15 excuses on why you can't serve the Lord or why you can't be saved, there's going to come a time where you wish you hadn't had an excuse and you wish you would have stepped out and asked Jesus into your heart. Listen, this morning, what are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? God's here. There's people here that care about you, that love you, and my goodness sakes, want to see you make it in this thing. Want to see you make it. You know, I'm not here this morning to satisfy Mick. I love Mick. I appreciate him, but I'm not here. I'm here to satisfy God this morning. That's who I'm here to satisfy. I ain't here to satisfy anybody else. 
And if you're here and you're lost and you're empty and you feel worthless and miserable, God moved in that world so he can move in yours. He can move in yours. I'm going to ask if you'd stand this morning. I'm going to ask him to sing whatever God's placed upon their heart. And if you're here this morning and you feel like that, these altars are wide open for you this morning. Won't you come? Won't you come? Amen. God's here. The Holy Ghost is here today. He's in our midst. He's in our midst. Ain't no God that can love like him. Ain't no God that can save like him. Won't you just try him today?